We have drawn a straight piece of wire whose length is 10 meters, as indicated by this dimension here, and then we have arbitrarily cut the wire at this location. And we don't yet know where we're going to make that cut, but when we make that cut, we're going to call this distance right here x, and since the entire length of the wire is 10, then the remaining piece after the cut would be 10 minus x. And what we'll do is we'll take the portion that we've labeled x, and we're going to bend that into a square. So if we did that, we would obtain a picture that looks something like this. Now notice, since the entire perimeter around the square would be x, that each side of the square would have to be x divided by 4, because you have to take that total perimeter and then divide it by the four sides that compose the square. So this would be the square. The equilateral triangle that is formed by the other piece of the wire, the yellow piece, is a little more challenging to draw. So let's take a moment to do that. So here is that equilateral triangle. Remember that the entire perimeter of that equilateral triangle is going to be 10 minus x. So that would be the total length of all three sides. Let's say we wanted to figure out the length of just this side of the equilateral triangle. Well, we would have to take that total perimeter of 10 minus x and then divide it by three because there are three sides. So this side of the equilateral triangle becomes 10 minus x all divided by three. That's basically the base of the equilateral triangle. But what we also need, as we will see later, is an expression for the height of this equilateral triangle. And to figure out an expression for that height, let's investigate the 30, 60, 90 right triangle. Now in a 30, 60, 90 right triangle, if we know the length of the side opposite of the 30 degree angle, let's call that side A, then the side that is opposite of the 60 degree angle is a radical 3. So if we look at our drawing over here, this side of our equilateral triangle would indeed be opposite of a 30 degree angle. So why don't we try to figure out what the length of this green side is? Well, we know that the entire base of the right triangle, excuse me, of the equilateral triangle is 10 minus x over 3. So this little green side would just be half of that. This would be 10 minus x over 3 times one half. Now in fact, if we multiplied it by a half, we could multiply these denominators right here, making it six. So we're just gonna come back here and make this six. So that would be sort of the A as represented by our standard 30, 60, 90 triangle. And as we said, the side that's across from the 60 degree angle will just be A times radical three. So this side right here, we can represent as 10 minus x over 6 times radical 3. So that's the value of h, and we're going to write that down accordingly. Again, it's going to be 10 minus x over 6, that quantity multiplied by the square root of 3. So that's the height of our equilateral triangle. Next, we need to come up with an expression for the total area. That's what this question is really all about. So we're going to have to take the area, and it's composed of the area of the square, which we'll abbreviate SQ, plus the area of the equilateral triangle. So that's what we're going to do is sum those areas. Looking back at the square, we know that the area would be one side multiplied by the other side. Both sides are x divided by 4. So we could actually express that as x divided by 4 squared plus the area of this triangle. Now the area of a triangle is 1 half times the base. Remember the base is the 10 minus x over 3. And then times the height, and that's that other expression, 10 minus x over 6 times radical 3. So here is our area function expressed in terms of a single variable x. We certainly want to clean this up. So let's square x over 4. That gives us x squared over 4. Excuse me, that would be x squared over 16. Let's not forget to square the 4 in the denominator there. And then as for the second term, let's see here. We have 2 times 3 times 6 times 1. There's a 1 under there. And so we have to multiply all those denominators. So 2 times 3 times 6 is going to be 36. 
And then the numerators would be 1 times radical 3. So we're going to have radical 3 over 36. We also have to multiply 10 minus x by 10 minus x. It's going to be simplest to write that as 10 minus x squared. So there is our area function. It's looking pretty good so far. We might want to note the values of x that would make sense in the context of the problem. So one lower bound for x would be 0. So if you imagine x equals 0, that would simply mean that we don't make a cut at all, basically. We would sort of make the cut at the far left end of the wire, but that would be no cut at all. So we know that x is bounded by 0. And then it's also bounded by 10, if you think about it, because the entire length of the wire is 10. We certainly couldn't make any cut beyond 10 because there would be no wire there to even cut. So the upper bound of x would be 10. And as we will see, this lower and upper bound will be very important in analyzing the maximum and minimum areas. So we have an area function. We have the bounds or the domain of our function. We now need to find the absolute minimum as well as the absolute maximum. And what we'll do for that is apply the closed interval method. This is a method you might have learned about earlier in this chapter. Now in the closed interval method, what you're going to want to do is compute the derivative. So you're going to want to find a prime and then set that equal to zero. So that's our first step in the closed interval method. Here we go. We're going to find a prime and notice when we do the derivative of x squared over 16, you might want to think of that as 1 16th x squared because that makes taking the derivative a little easier. You would multiply the 2 by 1 16th, which would give you 2 16ths which reduces to 1 eighth, and then you would have x to the power of 1 because you have to subtract 1 from the power. Next, we apply a chain rule. We're going to multiply 2 by this coefficient here. That's going to give us 2 radical 3 over 36, but 2 over 36 reduces to 1 over 18. So it's really just radical 3 over 18. Then you sort of recopy the inner function, 10 minus x, Raise it now to the power of 1. You don't have to write the 1 if you don't want to. But then the chain rule dictates that we multiply by the derivative of the inside. The derivative of 10 minus x would be 0 minus 1, which is just negative 1. And in fact, what happens here, you multiply that by negative 1, and that basically just makes it a negative radical 3 over 18. So what I like to do is just change that plus sign to a minus sign. There's our derivative. Now, as we noted, we have to set this equal to 0. This is going to allow us to find our so-called critical number. Now, solving this isn't the most pleasant thing in the world. And perhaps we could multiply each term by 72. That will turn out to work nicely here. We're going to multiply this by 72, this by 72, and technically the right side needs to be multiplied by 72 as well. 72 times 1 eighth is basically 72 divided by 8, so that's just 9 and then x minus 72 divided by 18 should be 4. So then you'll have that 4 times the radical 3 and then times the 10 minus x. This is still equal to 0. So that makes it look a little bit nicer, I suppose. We'll distribute the 4 radical 3. So we'll have 9x minus 40 radical 3. And then we're going to have plus 4 radical 3x. Notice it's a plus because the negative multiplied by a negative makes it positive. This is still equal to 0. Let's add the 40 radical 3 to the other side. So now you would have 9x plus 4 radical 3x is equal to 40 radical 3. And then we can factor an x out on the left side. If we factor that out, that leaves us with a 9 plus 4 radical 3. And then finally, we can divide both sides by that 9 plus 4 radical 3. This gives us an x of 40 radical 3, all divided by 9 plus 4 radical 3. That's not a pretty looking value for x, but it is correct. So now what do we do in the closed interval method? Well, we have to look at the endpoints. Recall that x was bounded by 0 and 10. So we're going to look at both the endpoints, the lower and the upper. We also have to look at this critical number. And what do we do with all these things? Well, we plug them into the area equation. That's how the closed interval method works. So what we're going to have to do, unfortunately, perhaps, is take this area equation, and we're going to plug in the endpoints as well as the critical number. So here we go. Why don't we investigate the first and lower endpoint, a of 0. So if we plug 0 in, we're going to have 0 over 16 
plus radical 3 over 36. And then you're going to have 10 minus 0, which is 10. So this just becomes 10 squared. If you simplify that, this cancels. You're going to end up with 100 radical 3 over 36. In a moment, we'll punch that into a calculator to see what that actually equals. Now, unfortunately, we have to plug in 10, the upper bound. And so you're going to have 10 squared over 16. Notice when you plug 10 in over here, you're going to have 10 minus 10, which is just 0. So that would entirely zero that out. So we can just write this as 100 over 16. Now comes the fun part. We have to plug in 40 radical 3 over 9 plus 4 radical 3 into the area function. OK, so I've written it out right here. It's a really ghastly thing. And I punched it into my calculator because I didn't feel like simplifying that. And I got about 2.72. And then as for the other values, plugging in the endpoints, the lower endpoint, if we simplify that one, that is about 4.81. And then this is exactly 6.25. So in this closed interval method, what we're going to realize is that the smallest value for the area, which is 2.72, would be the absolute minimum. So this is the absolute minimum area. We'll just write absolute min right here. And then the largest value we get is the absolute max. So this turns out to be the absolute max area right here. Now let's just make sure we've answered the question. We'll go back and it says, how should the wire be cut? So they want the value of x. They want to locate how much of the wire needs to be cut to produce the maximum and the minimum. So for part A, the maximum, we noted that a maximum amount of area was obtained when x equaled 10. Now that's interesting because technically when x equals 10, that's the full extent of the wire, so you're not really even cutting it. And then for the minimum area, which was 2.72, that was when x equaled this ridiculous value of 40 radical 3 over 9 plus 4 radical 3. And if you're interested, that's roughly 4.35. And these both would be measured in meters. So these would be the correct answers for part A and part B. Thanks for taking the time to watch the video. If you're interested in making a small donation to my cause, I would greatly appreciate it. But if not, no worries. I appreciate you taking the time regardless.